Hey Martin, for the very nice introduction. I hope you can all uh, hear me clearly. No. Um, so, um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and give you a glimpse of uh, uh, some topics that I find uh, of interest. Uh, so, I entitled this presentation The Mathematics of Smart Cities, and what I'm planning to do first is to break down the title a little bit. Um, to give you a bit of context, I'm a control system center here by education. I'm a member of the control group here in the engineering science department, and most of my research papers look a bit like this. They're quite messy with a lot of mathematical equations. Um, so, what I thought of not doing today is not to show any equation at all but still try to persuade you, if you want, that certain mathematical tools are really useful, if not necessary, to address real-life problems like the ones that appear in what I would refer to in the SQL as smart cities. So my goal for today is to give you a systems theoretic perspective on how we can address a wide range of problems that appear in this ecosystem. Um, so what, what I, said, uh, I, uh, I will do today is to give you a systems perspective uh, about different problems that appear in the area of smart cities. And uh, uh, what I will also not do is I will not make you stand up like Mark. <laughs> okay, um, so let me start by a definition. How do we define a city that is called smart? This definition is quite loose and in some sense subjective. Uh, I would say that a city is smart if we are able to exploit technology so that we can improve our everyday life experience how we can advance operations and services uh, that have to do either with transportation, energy, and many other factors. So the reason that we are interested in this transition, the reason that we are interested in bringing intelligence into our everyday operations, is because we want to ensure safety, we want to increase efficiency, we want to maximize our profits as a community, and we also want to achieve sustainability, uh, a topic that has attracted a lot of interest lately in the climate change. So what you see in this uh, uh, cartoon example here is a lot of uh, things moving around, cars, um, uh, trains and other transportation means. A smart city is much beyond this. It's how we exploit the information and communication infrastructure so that we are able to exploit connectedness between our transportation means, our buildings and the different individuals. And what the ICT infrastructure offers to us is a huge amount of data. Data that are collected from different levels, at governmental scales, at the level of companies, up to the level of single individuals, if you think about the course. And more than that, what this ICT infrastructure offers is information corridors, a way that we can use so that we can reach individuals, um, uh, so either users in that ecosystem or companies, so that they, uh, they achieve certain tasks. So those, uh, those issues have been recognized widely by different governments worldwide, UK being among them with huge investments uh, into the so-called smart city arena. And there are different uh, 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 market key factors in that area, transportation and energy are two of them, but it's also how we manage water resources, how we manage waste, how we assist living and so on. And those five key factors are interconnected with each other. So my research areas focus more on the first two areas here, so the transportation and the energy arena, and in particular at the interface between the two. So we'd like to focus a bit more into those two elements. If we think about transportation, what we try to do, and this is a partial answer to the question we heard before, is we want to move away from a traditional driving lifestyle, if you want, and use technology so that we make informed and uh, uh, choices and advice to users on how and when they should use different transportation means. So we offer a portfolio of services or options to the users. Mobility will be connected in the future and we may even share mobility so that we can reduce urban density. Moreover, there is a, a, a lot of discussion, we, we had one uh, after the previous talk, about sustainable transport. So how we can increase the penetration of electric vehicles so that we can move to alternative means of transport. If we think about the energy management arena, a, a, a lot of the discussion here is about how we manage resources at the building level or at the community level. 
So, for example, we may want to get information about sensors that might be in that building, about the temperature levels, the occupancy levels, and so on, and use that information so that we can introduce automation. We may want, for example, our blinds to go on and off in an automatic manner. We may want to change the settings of our cooling devices, our air conditioning units, and so on, without causing discomfort, but at the same time gaining a lot of energy savings. So where this goes into the energy market is that a lot of traditional consumers in that area are not monolithic, are not static anymore, but they, uh, uh, they are rather flexible. Electric grid is again another example in the energy system. They could be thought as dynamic batteries. And we can exploit the flexibility on when and how much uh, power we need to charge our vehicles so that we alleviate, we do not overwhelm the main grid. Consumers that have that flexibility are often termed prosumers, because they are somewhere in between producers and consumers. Okay, so I, 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 I described a few of the problems that appear in smart cities. There are many more coordination problems uh, that we can encounter. So what I would like to do now is to zoom out a bit and see this from a high level point. So, if you think about the smart city, this is nothing else than a big collection of systems, a system of systems. We can get a lot of out, uh, data at the output of that ecosystem, and what we want to achieve is we want to improve the schedules that we follow, either as individuals or uh, as companies. So, for those of you that have a system theoretic background, I can see already two of my students in the third row. You can imagine what comes next. I will try to close that loop, as we say, and introduce feedback. We want to learn from data that we may collect from sensors at the output of the different systems, and we want to hopefully come up with an intelligent schedule that can improve our experience. However, the issue with smart cities is that feedback is not the end of the story. There are certain difficulties certain challenges that we need to overcome so that we, uh, that we get the merits of this traditional part. So uh, those challenges uh, refer to the scalability of the problem. We have a high degree of connectedness between many heterogeneous entities. Some of them might even be strategic in the sense that they just care about maximizing their own profits. Something changed now, so I hope you can hear me loudly. So we may just care about maximizing our own profits. You can think about different v electric vehicle companies, for example. Um, uh, and in that sense, they don't care about um, uh, the overall benefit for the entire population. At the same time, there is a lot of randomness, a lot of uncertainty in an ecosystem like the one of smart cities. Okay? This could be either because of incomplete knowledge of certain parts of the operations. This could be due to privacy concerns or because of exogenous uncertainty, you can think, for example, about renewable energy sources that are intermittent. So the way to overcome those challenges is to resort to mathematical tools. And I have listed here three main pillars that have characterized my research in that area. The first one has to do with networks, how we can exploit graph theory and network theory so that we can exploit the degree of connectedness between different subsystems. The second one has to do with game theory, so that we address the strategic intentions of the different entities within our city. And the last one has to do with learning, so that we account for the presence of randomness, together with the simultaneous availability of data. So what I'm going to do in the next 15 minutes or so is to explain how we can use tools from each of those fields in a specific application that appears in smart cities and in particular, I will talk about electric vehicle scheduling, which is somewhere in between energy and transportation. Okay, so let me introduce the setting. So in an electric vehicle scheduling problem, we have the vehicles. So this could be thought of as dynamic batteries. Okay? So vehicles need to decide when and how much power to charge while keeping certain preferences local. For example, I don't want to share with everybody else that has an electric vehicle the specs of my car. I don't want to share information about my journey. 
Typically, what electric vehicles do is they respond to price signals. So the question here is who sets that price? This could be either a physical entity, an aggregator, that calculates the total, for example, electric vehicle demand and comes up with a price signal. All of this could be done implicitly according to the market structure by the rest of the grid. What is the relationship between price and demand? This has to do with the rules of the market. Okay. So for different markets, we have different relationships. A very intuitive and simplistic one would be that an increase in the total demand will also make the price higher. This is coherent with our intuition. So the view that we are taking in an electric vehicle scheduling problem is a game theoretic one. Okay. So those vehicles could be strategic. They just care about maximizing their own profit. So what we want to do is we want to treat vehicles as players in a game with the aggregator, that means the price setter, being an additional player. And we want to come up with algorithms, with procedures that can return a solution from which no vehicle would have an incentive to deviate. So we would be happy with our schedule, acknowledging the fact that also other electric vehicles in the population or companies, if you want, of electric vehicles will be thinking the same way as well. Okay. So I will not describe the algorithm in mathematic terms, but I would rather give you the conceptual um, uh, flowchart of such an algorithm. So at the first step, each vehicle will uh, come up with a tentative schedule about how much power and when they need to charge. At the next step, what vehicles will have to do exploiting the infrastructure that is present and, uh, in cities is to broadcast that information about their tentative schedule to the, to the aggregator. So the aggregator will then um, uh, compute the total electric vehicle demand and calculate a price. A price according to the rules of the game that we described before, our demand price curve. Okay. This price will then be broadcasted back to the individual vehicles that will then update their schedule and this process will be repeated again and again until hopefully it converges somewhere. Okay. Good. So there are a few questions here. The first one is, how do we design those update steps? This is basically the job of systems engineers. I will not go into this. Okay. And what do we want out of the final product? Are we just happy if such a procedure converges? Do we care at all about a system that someone will suggest us, about a schedule for our vehicle that someone will suggest? So the mathematical analysis that we do allows us to answer those questions. They allows us to have guarantees that we can come up with a solution. And this solution would be a least regret one. That means a, 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 an equilibrium solution for that virtual game between the uh, different electric vehicles and the aggregate. Moreover, because the local computation step so the computation of the tentative schedule is done locally at the VIC level. We don't have to share information that we consider as private. I will not describe the mechanics of that algorithm further, but I would like to illustrate in that figure the final product that we want. So what you see here with the green curve is the so-called duck-looking uh, curve for the ones that are familiar with the energy and, and uh, uh, markets. This is how a typical demand profile for non-electric vehicle users looks like in some average day in the UK. So there is a big dip towards certain parts of the day where people are at work and most of our uh, uh, devices at home are, are, are switched off. So what we would like for our schedule is effectively to fill in that valley that is created here simply because we'll avoid overwhelming demand and other time instances of the day, so alleviating the grid, and at the same time exploit the fact that prices tend to be lower during that part of the day because demand is lower. So this is the property which is exhibited by the equilibrium solution that is returned by our algorithm. It has this nice valley filling property. So in some sense, this is a good solution. Uh, so up to now, I discussed quite a bit on how we can think the electric scheduling problem as a game between different vehicles and price setters. However, there is still quite a bit of information that we have to share. 
we need to send our tentative demands to the aggregator and we may not be willing to do so. So a natural question here is, can we go one step ahead and remove this aggregating unit from the picture? So this is what peer-to-peer -peer trading does. We, rather than having a single authority with which we share information, we rather exchange information with some of the vehicles in our population that we consider as neighbors. So if you see a link between those two vehicles, doesn't mean that we necessarily have a physical link between the two, but it is rather a level of trust, a willingness to share information among those. Good. So this is an appealing setting. We don't need to have a central authority in place, but there are more challenges. The challenge here is that we could not have a global price signal unless someone aggregates the total demand. So what happens in that case is that each vehicle calculates a local price estimate. How is this performed? They can simply exchange information with everybody in the neighborhood, and this will give some tentative info about the neighborhood's demand levels. Each of those vehicles in that population will maintain a possibly different price signal. So the additional problem here is we not only care about reaching an equilibrium solution for the charging levels of the different vehicles, but we also want to make sure that the local price estimates that each vehicle maintains reach consensus to a common price vector that would be the market clearing price. So by tweaking the conceptual algorithm that we described before, we achieve two things at the same time. We design a new market structure so that we um, uh, get a clearing price, and at the same time we come up with a charging schedule for our vehicles without oversharing information within our um, uh, community. What I, I, I showed here in that figure is the price behavior for the price estimates maintained by the different agents. So color coding corresponds to the different vehicles that we have in our population. They start from a completely different price estimate, but as communication rounds increase, those price profiles collapse to a single value that will be the clearing market price. Okay. So what I did up to now is I tried to illustrate how tools from network theory, graph theory, and game theory could be useful when it goes into electric vehicle scheduling. So what goes under the hood there? Okay. So someone may ask, is this an efficient schedule? We said before that one of the goals in smart cities is to increase efficiency, but efficiency at the city level. I may not care if the different vehicles maximize their own profits or they are not very unhappy. I may just care about maximizing the benefit for the entire population. So we need a metric to decide whether the schedule that such a smart algorithm provides is a good one, is an efficient one. Okay. So colleagues in computer science came up with a very sexy title for such a metric that goes under the term of price of anarchy. Okay. And in fact, one of the researchers that gave this name to that, uh, to that metric is here in Oxford in the computer science department. So uh, what we tried to do in, in, in the electric vehicle scheduling problem then was could we compute the price of anarchy? Could we get a metric on the efficiency of the equilibrium solutions that our algorithms compute? And to answer that question, we monitor nature. What birds and fish is doing. Okay? So you may have a lot of distinct individuals that may act selfishly, but sometimes as their number increases, they achieve something useful, something interesting. As uh, I try to illustrate in this cartoonish example, if you have kids, you may recognize the movie. Good. So we tried then to translate that observation into math, okay? which is what we do, we do for Joe. Okay? And how does this go? It means that as the number of vehicles in our population increases, then the equilibrium solution that you may get from a smart algorithm tends to a social welfare solution. That means to a hypothetical setting where everybody communicates with everybody else so that you maximize the profit for the entire population. Good. So one way of interpreting that limiting relationship is that the more vehicles penetrate into the market, the more likely it is that subconsciously 
they act cooperatively. Good. So I tried to illustrate this again in my duck looking curve, this one. And you can see two valley filling profiles this time. With red, I tried to illustrate the equilibrium solution returned by our smart in quotes algorithm. And with blue is the target solution that you could get that would be of benefit for everyone in the population. Okay. Clearly those two are different because this is a very small fleet, only five vehicles. Okay. You could have them at your home yard. Okay. However, as the number of vehicles increases, those two curves tend to coincide, or in other words, we flatten the red curve. And there has been a lot of discussion the last two years about flattening a curve as the number of individuals that share a common property, for example, they are um, uh, infected by the virus, increases. Okay? So there are many more similarities with what we are doing here that go beyond the conceptual um, uh, uh, level of increasing the number of individuals that have a property in a population. Okay. So let me change gears a bit. So I chatted about networks and game theory and how we can use those tools to compute electric vehicle scheduling solutions. What I would like to touch uh, a, a bit in my last minutes is what happens when we have uncertainty, randomness in our systems. And most of our everyday operations have high degrees of randomness. So my view here is a bit pragmatic. We have to embrace the fact that we have uncertainty, okay? And try to do the best that we can given that awareness, okay? How can we exploit technology for this? We could have access to data, okay? So you may have access to a data set, a data bug, as I pictorially illustrated here. And you can use observations from what happens in your ecosystem to come up with a schedule. Okay? And it could very well be that that schedule, even though it was based on data, it's still a good one. Good one means that it may work very well when it comes to the actual life and to the actual realization of uncertainties that may affect your systems. And it might be that I use another data set and I still get a very nice solution um, uh, in my problem. But there could be also unfortunate situations where the data set that someone will give me could be completely uninformative. It could be just that all my data points collapse to a certain part of my space. In that case, any schedule that you try to make will not be very useful. Okay? So what this schematic diagram is trying to say is that decisions that are based on data are inherently random. But at the same time, we have no other way when we're making decisions on schedules in, in a city from relying on data. That means making random schedules. So if we stopped here, this wouldn't have been very nice because we wouldn't have confidence on the schedules that we are making. And even more than that, if you think about safety critical applications in our everyday life, like driving cars or even more driving planes, this would have been a disaster. Okay? So we want to go one step ahead. Okay? And what we will try to do is to say how likely it is to come up with good schedules no matter what the data set that we are using is. Okay? Ideally, this is the situation that we would like to have when we will build decisions on data. Unfortunately, this is not the case. I don't have a positive answer for that question. And the reason is you could have bad situations like the one here, the one that we schematically discussed before in the sense that you have unrepresentative data. So what we can do is we can embrace the fact that there is a certain level of risk in our schedules and relax that requirement. We can say that we would be happy with the schedules that we get from a device, from a smart supportive system, as long as these are good enough for most of the data sets that someone used to build those decisions. Okay. So this phrase for most implies that we have to rely in yet another field of maths, which is probability theory and statistics. This is exactly what we did here. We tried to use those tools so that we can accompany our learned 
random schedules with confidence certificates. So not only we will offer a schedule to the user, but also an a priori quantified confidence on how likely it is that this schedule is good enough. So this might seem a bit abstract, but in the California of 80s, they used to run a very big pilot program where they were selling energy service contracts together with reliability levels. Those reliability levels were just probabilities that your service will be disrupted for a certain amount of time. And as you can imagine, the more likely it was that your schedule was disrupted, the less money you had to pay. So what we are doing here is we are calculating those reliability levels so that we can accompany our schedules. So this brings me towards the, the end of this talk. Uh, uh, to sum up, I, I try to outline several mathematical tools ranging from networks, game theory, and statistical learning that I believe we have to use in a synergetic manner so that we tackle challenges that appear in several of the problems that we face in our everyday life in smart cities. Of course, smart cities are, are much, much broader than that. They involve several socio-political issues, ethical issues, and so on. However, I will not touch upon those because this would be uh, uh, yet a different talk. And I would like to conclude with one of my favorite quotes by Galileo, which also inspired quite a bit the title of my presentation. And it's completely aligned with my belief that in an engineering science department and as engineers, if we want to engineer real life problems like smart cities, we have to use the language of math. Thank you very much for your attention. I would be happy to take any questions. <laughs>